Hello and welcome to another episode of the Doctor Who Fan Podcast, I am your host once again Jeffrey Gibson and coming up on today's edition, I am going to be reviewing the story Galaxy 4, so let's get on with it. The most substantial amount of video material from this story can be found on the Aztecs, special edition DVD from March 2013, which includes the newly rediscovered episode 3, Airlock and both the 5 minute and 10 second clips from episode 1, all presented as part of a 64 minute recreation of the entire story. The recreation is composed mostly of a montage of telesnap and still frames accompanying the original television soundtrack, but it also features many shots of the Chumbly machines achieved with very satisfying full motion 3D CGI models. As written, this is a very excellent and exceptional story having all the elements I like to see in a Doctor Who adventure. Its production is a good distance from being perfect, but all things considered, Season 3 can boast opening with a decent sci-fi story that is more interesting, serious, and climactic than anything Season 2 put out. Verity Lambert's last real story as producer is something of a triumph. The distinctive library music tracks build a light but nevertheless alien atmosphere for the lonely dying planet on which this adventure takes place. The music is okay for the most part, successfully alien and even brilliant in some places, and generally works. Knowing these particular tracks as well as I do, I don't think the production team always managed to find the most appropriate sections to back every scene often selecting bits that were too serene instead of some of the more suspenseful or action-oriented sections that were available, but this doesn't detract much from the story. The TARDIS seems to have made a good materialization on the original television broadcast. Although the novelization unfortunately skips over it, the new recreation on DVD nicely indulges us with it again. The rest of the essential features of the TARDIS and those of the main characters are well demonstrated in the opening sequence, as they encounter their first Chumbly robot, and both parties become curious and investigate each other from either side of the TARDIS interior, exterior barrier. One couldn't ask for anything better in theory, although the recreation is limited in being able to showcase the interior space. Fear of the unknown has no power to stop the three regular characters from exploring outside the ship and beyond, as well, as they eagerly jump into danger and first contact situations. They'll also tackle heroics in satisfying fashion before they're finished with this place. All the right stuff, in the right order, starting the season off to boot. The appearance stereotypes of sci fi good guys and bad guys are neatly swapped, of course and this forms the major theme of the story. This works as an objective observation, but subjectively are all the right things demonstrated by dialogue and performances? In this area, the novel is more polished than the televised version. It takes a bit of time for our travelers to sort out who's who in the novel, but it still happens fairly quickly. Halfway through the first episode, they know quite well that they don't like the dolled up drawings. On television, it appears to happen even faster, dangerously fast in fact. Not only do the Doctor and Vicky notice the Drahan's bad qualities early, they seem to realize it before even getting to know them their tone of voice gives that away, knowing enough not to judge a book by its cover, the Doctor and Vicky settle for the alternative of judging this book by its last page instead, not giving the Drahan's as fair a chance as good first contact etiquette would dictate. Part of this is the script's fault, but writer William Imms, to his credit, did a good job of fixing this in his novel, removing most of the giveaway dialogue, and reinserting the gist of it later when the time for judgment is more ripe, and when the main characters can put it to a less confrontational use by thinking it or discussing it amongst themselves. The altered timing on 2013's DVD recreation might have allowed it to tighten up this aspect and bring it closer in line with the novel, but this doesn't really happen. The version on DVD is about the same as that of the full CD audio in offering corrected judgments a little too quickly and harshly. Advice on how not to judge someone, like all advice on what not to do, pales in comparison to advice on what to do. 
seek first to understand. This the book achieves much better than the TV story. Unfortunately, the doctor's pointless fib over the timing of the catastrophe is left as is, a black mark against his character in both versions which can do absolutely zero to help his situation. The other half of the blame in not giving the draft-ins a fair chance must go to the cast, who quite possibly over-rehearsed the story until they forgot that they're not supposed to know how bad the draft-ins are at first. Hostility enters their voices a little too easily in many cases. William Hartnell has had better scenes of introduction to guest characters, but he doesn't do too badly here, and still manages some choice lines with excellent delivery. Judging by sound alone, the Dravins themselves seem to act a little stiffly, which is not altogether out of character for them. The existing five-minute film clip reveals additional visual nuances that make the performances significantly more believable. However, they are meant to be emotional beings, and the fear and loathing of the reals that motivates them throughout the story is still not quite all that it should be. That said, getting a complete episode plus many stills from the other episodes unveils much of what wasn't conveyed by voice alone, and the Dravins actually become much more believable. Stephanie Bidmed, playing the Dravin leader Marga, puts in a very compelling performance that outclasses many of the strong women seen in later years of the show, including New Millennium Who, and that performance is chiefly responsible for selling many of the story's more bone-chilling moments. Good stuff. Musically, the Dravins are sometimes accompanied by a swinging, blues clarinet sound out of the 1920s, 30s or 40s. This is kind of weird, as it doesn't fit well with their characters, but with visuals, it can work as a counterpoint. Something a little more sinister would be more in line with them. Now, if Brian Hodgson had slowed that clarinet down and processed it, Robert Cartland's performance of the real voice sounds a bit on the pompous, high and mighty side, and doesn't convey the real tranquility so carefully mapped out in the novelization. The regulars and the rills end up a bit on the smug and pleased with themselves side of things when all is said and done. However, content matters more than style, especially with a story poised to make that very point, and the rills' words and actions speak louder than their hasty, makeshift vocal qualities. Getting over their voice is another of the ethical challenges presented. The Drahines deserve little sympathy from our regular characters from episode 1 onwards, but what really sustains Galaxy 4 is that regulars and Drahins alike continue to fear the reals even more up until the middle of episode 3. This is largely because they don't see them at all, and their robotic chumbly servants are very enigmatic alien caricatures, unable to communicate effectively during this time, and resembling the very untrustworthy Daleks to boot. The sounds you will almost certainly remember long after hearing this story are those of the Chumblies. Brian Hodgson has assembled one of his most effective montages to date, successfully bringing to life these creations, alien yet neutral, mysterious and sinister while remaining unknown, yet containing a cute pattern and orderly beauty. Once the communication barrier is broken, the Rill's good nature is plain for everyone to see. Even with additional revelations about the first encounter between these two alien species from the Rills' point of view left for the major turning point later in the adventure, the characters are allowed to present themselves true to form throughout the story, no elaborate maneuvers required, and there is much gripping conflict all the way through for all concerned. Thus it seems to be much better written than similar ideas inherent in the rescue, story number 11, and the censor writes, and drives the point home better. Galaxy 4 generally has better written action as well, and the Doctor's your man in this one as the central, heroic character. Stephen's contributions in helping to disable a Chumbly by the pit novel only and in matching Marga toe to toe on a physical level should be noted, as should Vicky's initial first contact negotiations with the Rills. The Doctor is much more of the habitual, reasonable, lead problem solver in this one though, and it's a vast improvement over his usual season 2 antics. His heroic contribution to the story's resolution continues slow but steady all throughout the final episode, 
while also leaving a lot of time for diplomatic niceties to be exchanged, and a high-tech sci-fi guerrilla battle to ensue on the planet's surface, keeping the level of drama high, interesting and logical all throughout as the episode builds to a satisfying climax. Sadly, not everything is improved by having new visuals of the story. The biggest letdown by far is the design of the real spacecraft, which suggests at every turn that the budget for year two's recording block had run out. It ends up looking like some kind of greenhouse with absolutely no ability to be airtight, while the script absolutely demands that it maintain different atmospheres in different compartments. The biggest design mistake here is definitely the transparent nature of most walls, which destroys the viewer's ability to imagine that far more technical wizardry and undiscovered sections might be hiding behind them. We could excuse a small set inside a large spacecraft, but transparent walls suggest the craft's exterior is really too small as well. The doctor's dialogue works against this bizarrely, as he continually praises the Rill's advanced spacecraft design. Thankfully though, the reels themselves work well, and we somehow only manage to see as much of them at any time as the script intends. I had half expected some 3D CGI shots of launching spacecraft and an exploding planet, but such avenues were not pursued in the recreation. The final battles are also somewhat limited. The Dravin's weapons, while making a cameo in Genesis of the Daleks some ten years later operate on flash charges which is about as good as you get on Doctor Who before superimposed lasers started much later. The Chumblies get little puffs of steam for their weapons, which seems less advanced, but this effect does at least get a more impressive debut in part 1. Sound effects for laser blasts are particularly lame this time around. A quiet and dull bit of white noise that is practically inaudible whenever something else is going on. Improvement here could have lifted the excitement level of the drama's conclusion considerably. In terms of new visuals, what really impresses most is some of the creative work of director Derek Martinus, both in getting really enjoyable performances out of all the actors, and in often showing action that was in no way suggested by the sound alone. And of course, CGI chumblies allow a lot of their action to be on screen, and possibly more effective and glitch free than had been the case in the original footage. In cases where action could not be visually recreated, we get subtitles explaining it for us, as had been done with the 2000 AD VHS recreation of the 10th planet, as opposed to the less enjoyable narration in the VHS abridgment for the Ice Warriors. The final moments of Galaxy 4 still work quite well, and the story could end on a high note there. Unfortunately, we also get a prologue to the prologue for the Dalek Master Plan, an uninspiring scene of a delirious man in a jungle consumed with murderous thoughts. This is not at all suspenseful, particularly as no confrontation can be anticipated between him and the regular characters, not to mention the fact that, with the Doctor having just complained that this sort of unrest happens all the time, it all seems so routine for this show, and the poor scene merely detracts from the moral point of Galaxy 4. It might have been better to videotape the regular's comments as the introduction to next week's episode, and not have anything of the jungle of Kemble as a part of this story at all. The presentation on the 2013 DVD also leaves something to be desired in lumping the whole story together as a single menu item of 64 minutes 41 seconds duration. Thankfully, it is split up with 16 chapter points, in which episode 3 can be seen complete with its own individual titles and credits in chapters 7 to 12. No division between episodes 1 and 2 can be easily identified here. But then episode 1 never did have a great cliffhanger anyway. Episodes 2 and 3 have much stronger cliffhangers, which are easy to enjoy in this DVD version. All things considered, Galaxy 4 is a top-notch season 3 story, and a great example of the Hartnell era at its best. I'm still secretly hoping that more of this one gets rediscovered on film earlier than many other missing Hartnell episodes. Had this story been a part of season 2, it would have easily have come out on top as the best story.
no contest. However, as a part of the more turbulent season 3, there are a number of other excellent stories ready to give it a good run for its money. Now it's time to mark this story, and as always I am going to be judging the acting, the directing, the writing and the overall execution, and the acting gets a 7 out of TWN, the directing gets a 6 out of 10, the writing gets a 8 out of 10 and the overall execution gets a 5 out of 10, and those marks give this story a 26 out of 40. Well that just about wraps up this episode, I do hope you have enjoyed listening, thank you so much for listening, stay safe and happy time traveling. <laughs>